This video goes over liability and validity in university assessment. Why is reliability and validity important? It is important because we are professionals in academia. It is also increasingly required by our creditors. Reliability and validity is best practice in research. And then there's also a quote, bad data is worse than no data. Let's go over some definitions of reliability and validity. Reliability is the extent to which your students' results are consistent. Validity is the extent to which the assignment tool, whether that be a paper, test, or project, that you're using to measure their learning is measuring what it is supposed to be measuring. Validity is also the extent to which you're utilizing the results appropriately. Let's talk about the scale scenario. This is a scenario that is often utilized to be able to educate folks on what is reliability and validity. So when you step on a scale to measure your weight, if the scale is reliable, it tells you the same weight every time that you step on it, as long as your weight has not actually changed. However, if the scale isn't working properly, this number may not be your actual weight. If that is the case, this is an example of a scale that is reliable or consistent, but not valid. For the scale to be valid and reliable, not only does it need to tell you the same weight every time you step on the scale, but it also has to measure your actual weight. When you're talking about education, the situation is essentially the same. A test can be reliable, meaning that the test takers will get the same score no matter what, when, or where they take it. But that doesn't mean that it is valid or measuring what it's supposed to measure. A test can be reliable without being valid. However, tests cannot be valid unless it is reliable. There are different types of reliability. Test retest reliability is when the same students take the same test twice and score similarly the second time as they did the first. Parallel forms reliability is when students who scored well on one version of the test would score well on another version of it. Internal consistency reliability is if a student scored well on questions 1 through 10 of the test about history, they should also score well on questions 11 through 20 of the test about history. Inner rater reliability is about two different raters. Dr. Hill, for example, scores the assignment and gives the student a four out of five on the rubric. Dr. Anderson scores the assignment and also gives that same student a four or five on the rubric. Both scores are the same or reliable. Intra-rater reliability is about one rater but multiple times. For example, Dr. Hill scores the assignment at 8 a.m. on a Monday when he is in a bad mood. He then scores it again at 10 p.m. on a Wednesday when he is in a good mood. Both scores were the same, so that means they were reliable. Okay, so we've defined the different types of reliability. Let's make it practical now. This is the type of reliability that we just went over, and here is the different type of evidence that can be used to show evidence of reliability based on the type. So we're gonna go over this different type of evidence now. The Pearson's correlation coefficient can be used for test retest reliability as well as, as well as parallel forms reliability. The correlation coefficient gives us an R number between negative one to positive one. And to show evidence of reliability, you would want to score 0 0.60 to 0 0.70 and above. A video on how to calculate Pearson's correlation coefficient in Excel is linked here. The Cronbex alpha is used for internal consistency reliability. This is also a measure of correlation. And to show evidence of reliability, you would want to score 0 0.70 or above. This is the A value. A video about how to calculate it in Excel is linked there. Next is percent. This is used for both inner rater and intra rater reliability. This provides a percent of agreement between scores. The instructions here list how you can calculate this percent by hand or you can calculate, in it, calculate it in Excel here. For inter-rater reliability, meaning more than one rater, please consider calibration training so that all raters are trained on the rubric and have a shared understanding of it prior to doing the actual assessment. Intra or inter-class correlation is used for inter-rater reliability when you have three or more raters. So this percent can be used when you have two, when you have three or more, you should change to intra or inner rater reliable correlation. This is the ICC number. This is a measure of correlation. 
And to show reliability, you would want to score 0.7 and above. This again is the ICC value. And a video about how to calculate this ICC value in SPSS is linked here. So in this case, again, you have three or more raters. You have Dr. Hill, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Mitchell. So that's why you have to use the ICC value instead of the percent. Next, let's move on to Cohen's, cap Cohen's kappa coefficient. This is used for inner rater when you have two plus raters, but the score is categorical, so non-numerical. So again, we have um, Dr. Hill, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Mitchell, so two or more. But this time we have categorical variables. So for example, Dr. Hill scores the assignment and gives the student two yeses and three noes on the rubric. Dr. Anderson scores the assignment and gives the student three yeses and two noes on the rubric. And Dr. Mitchell scores the assignment and gives the student four yeses and one no on the rubric. The scores here are yeses and no. They're not numerical. They're categorical in nature. So you have to use the Cohen's kappa coefficient to be able to establish reliability. This Cohen's kappa coefficient is a measure of agreement. And to show reliability, you would want to score a 0.6 and above. And this is the K value. A video about how to find the Cohen's kappa coefficient in Excel is linked here. All right, moving on. Now let's talk about validity. So like reliability, there are different types of validity. Face validity, face validity refers to whether a student or another non-subject matter expert would agree with how the assignment is built. Students have a stake in the quality of your instrument, so it's important that the assignment seems right to them. If it's a test on history, there shouldn't be a question on algebra, for example. Content validity refers to whether a subject matter expert would agree with how the assignment was built. Does the measure adequately cover the content and skills students are expected to know and demonstrate? Criterion validity relates to the predictability of performance, whether concurrently or in the future, with the assignment. So for example, if a student gets, if a student gets a high score on their final comprehensive nursing exam in college, can you also infer that the student would perform well on the NCLEX when they go up for RN licensing in the future? Another example, if a student scores well on the ACT, will they also score well on the SAT taken the same week? Finally, contract validity. This is more theoretical in nature and not as applicable to university assessment, but I did want to be sure to cover it. If you develop a questionnaire to diagnose depression, you need to know, does the questionnaire really measure the construct of depression? Or is it actually measuring the respondent's mood, self-esteem, or some other construct? To achieve construct validity, you have to ensure that your measurement is carefully developed relevant, carefully developed based on relevant existing knowledge. So we've defined the different types of validity. Let's make it practical now. These are the types that we've just defined, and this is the type of evidence of validity that you can utilize. And we're gonna go over that evidence now. Face validity, it should not be used because it's really not objective enough. So we're not gonna be going over that evidence. In addition, construct validity is not really often used in university assessment, but as an FYI, you could utilize a factor analysis. However, that's beyond the scope of this PowerPoint. So really right now we're gonna be focusing on content validity evidence and criterion validity evidence. There are two major types of content validity evidence that you can utilize. There's a matrix, matrix that you can create or some sort of write-up. And then there's the content validity ratio. So first we're gonna go over some different matrices that you could use. So here's a matrix for content validity. So let's say for example, you've created a test and you are, this is a test on chapters one through three of the book. So here's chapter one has a topic and chapter one has subtopics. Chapter two has a topic with subtopics and chapter three has a topic with subtopics. Does the test cover it? Does it semi cover it or does it not cover it at all? This is of course a very basic matrix, but you get the idea in terms of comparing the test to the textbook. Another type of matrix that you could use for content validity is comparing a communication rubric that you've used, that you've created, excuse me, to literature on communication. So there, when you went through the literature on communication, there was literature on written communication, oral, aural, and visual. So does your communication rubric that you've, created, that you've created adequately cover what's out there on communication? Yes, semi, or it does not cover it. And then finally, a content validity ratio can be used as well. And this is with subject matter experts. 
So here you're looking to see whether the assignment that you've created includes what it needs to include according to subject matter experts. So let's say you're a psychology, um, you've created a psychology test and it has several to five different questions on that test. And you want to bring in five different subject matter experts, which are psychologists because they're the subject matter experts in psychology. And what you would have them do is mark whether that particular question on the exam is essential, useful, but not essential or not essential. Based on this information, you are going to get a content validity ratio. You can calculate it by hand or you can calculate it in Excel. To interpret the results, you would want to see that the CVR, it's going to be between negative one and positive one. The closer the, uh, the closer the CVR is to one, the more essential the item is considered to be. So if it's closer to one, you're going to want to keep it in your exam. If it's closer to negative one, the more non-essential it is. And maybe you could strike that question from your exam. And 0.7 or above is considered valid. All right, moving on. Now we're talking about criterion validity evidence. This is the validity coefficient. And this is a reminder of what criterion validity is. That's the definition that we've already gone over. A video about how to calculate, it, calculate the validity coefficient in Excel is linked here. It is the same as the Pearson's correlation, which we went over with reliability. The correlation coefficient gives us an R number between negative one and positive one. And then to show evidence of validity, you would want a score of 0 0.30 or above. With reliability, that cutoff was different. So just keep in mind that validity is not as strict, 0 0.30 or above. Okay, so much of validity evidence is qualitative in nature. So you can utilize the following qualitative prompts to justify the interpretation and use of the data. So when you're thinking about interpreting the data, you're interpreting the scores and seeing whether they measure what they intend to measure. And when you're thinking about the use of the data, you're thinking about how am I going to utilize this information, this data, to be able to make some sort of decision or be able to make some sort of inference. So you can justify the validity of your assessment. You could justify the purpose, the context, you can justify the rubric if you're using if you're utilizing a rubric, and you can justify the inferences that is inferences that you're going to make based on those scores. So some different types of prompts that you can utilize to provide this justification are as follows. So if you want to justify the purpose of the assessment, describe the purpose of it. What is the relation of the relationship of the assessment to your curriculum? Why is this assessment important in your program? What are you going to use this assessment for? Why is this the right assessment to use for that? You can justify the context. Is the implementation strategy consistent with the purpose of the assessment? Is the way the assessment is implemented going to allow students to yield their best performance? If you're utilizing a rubric, you can justify that rubric. How do you know the levels of achievement you develop for the rubric are appropriate? Do the levels of achievement adequately cover all potential responses? And could any performance be in between scores? And then in terms of use, you can justify the inferences you'll make from the scores. So how do you know that the te test scores appropriately reflect the test's intended purpose? And does the assignment's cutoff scores correctly infer a student's level of achievement? So you can utilize some of these prompts to provide evidence of validity. So here's an example with a few prompts from here that have been chosen. The prompts are in bold. And so this is something that we have um, written up. It's a qualitative response about how we have chosen, um, how we are showing evidence of validity. So what is its relationship to your curriculum? So the biology faculty have written a program learning outcome as follows. Graduates in biology will be able to identify, describe, and explain the terminology, concepts, methodologies, and theories used within biological sciences. To measure this, the faculty have decided to adopt the Biology Major Field Test by Educational Testing Services, or ETS. This is a third-party test. So the next prompt is, describe the purpose of the assessment. The purpose of the test is to measure this PLO. So we've ensured that the PLO that the test includes uh, what we want it to include within the PLO. So identifying, describing, and explaining the terminology, concepts, methodologies, and theories. So they are aligned. The assessment is aligned with the PLO, and that's the purpose of it. Why is this assessment important in your program? What are you going to use this assessment for? 
So it is important to the program because by analyzing results from the tests, the biology faculty are able to make improvements to the major, which is required for accreditation purposes, as well as benefits future students in the major. Also, by utilizing the third party tests, the faculty will be able to compare our students' results with other institutions. Another prompt, is the way the assessment is implemented going to allow students to yield their best performance? The assessment will take place during the student's senior year after the completion of all biology coursework. Because this is a major field test, we want to ensure that all of our students have taken all the coursework required that's gonna be covered in that test first. And does the assignment's cutoff scores correctly infer a student's level of achievement? Well, the ETS major field tests are developed in partnership with experienced teaching faculty members across the country. They participate in determining test specifications, test questions, and types of scores reported. So this is an example of how you can choose several prompts from here to be able to provide evidence of validity. So back on this slide, we talked about justifying the rubric and then also deciding cut scores. So when you're justifying the rubric, you need to be able to explain how you've decided what's the difference between a three and a four, or what's the difference between a four and a five. Or for example, here with the cutoff scores, you know, when do students pass? When do students fail? So one way that you can do either of these is through a procedure called standard setting. And this is a validation tool. You can perform a standard setting process to find a defensible cut score. A cut score is a point on a score scale where individuals who score greater than that score pass and those who score less than that score fail. One way that you can do standard setting is through a bookmark method. This is when items are ordered in terms of their difficulty. So for exam, for an exam, you would have different questions and they would be in order of difficulty. Faculty would go through rounds and rounds to determine the point at which a student is competent. And then they would place a bookmark between when a student would be able to pass and when a student would fail. And that would identify the cut score in a standard setting way. So if you want to learn more about this standard setting validation, you can read more here or you can watch a video. There are some different threats to validity that you should be aware of. Did you give students enough time? So if students are rushed, they might just circle any answer toward the end. In that case, you wouldn't be measuring what you want to measure because instead students would have just rushed through the end. So you won't be able to accurately say whether the results are measuring what you want them to measure. Another threat to validity is, is the assessment equitable and culturally sound, or are there biases? So for example, you should not be testing for English terminology on a math test. So if you have some non-native English speakers in your class, for example, you need to be really careful that there isn't any sort of confusing terminology that is going to throw a student off when you really want to be measuring their math abilities. Is the content too easy or trivial? Did the students just memorize but not learn? Are there too few items on the test? And could a student have just guessed and got the correct answer? So in that case, true false questions. They really just have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. So these are just some ways that you want to make sure that you are measuring what you intend to measure. So validity evidence in summary. So there are two essential aims of defensible test development and use, validity. It can be simplified as straightforward as these research questions. So question one, what do these scores mean? How are they gonna be interpreted? Are they accurately measuring what they are supposed to measure? And then two, should these scores be used for blank? X is just what that specific use is. So as an example, are, the, are they accurately measuring what they're supposed to measure? So is the freshman math placement exam accurately measuring a student's math competence? Should the math placement exam be used to place students into the math class? These are the two questions that you have in terms of whether you need to justify whether they're valid. And then we provide evidence of different ways to be able to show that they're valid throughout this PowerPoint. Thank you. So some take home messages. Reliability is a property of the scores, not the test. And then we may have evidence to justify an interpretation or use, but once we wanna use the score for a new purpose, it is necessary to recollect justification and validity evidence again. Selection and development of a test should be done with considering intended uses and interpretations. Back to here, these two questions. There's some other ways to establish reliability and validity, but these are some of the most common ones. To obtain a copy of this PowerPoint so the web links are live, please email me. And if you have any questions, please contact me as well. Thank you so much.